Hello and welcome to Good Morning Transfers. Less than two weeks to go now until the window closes and there is plenty of business for Premier League sides to do. He's being called Erling Haaland's twin. Will Dusan Vlahovic end up at Arsenal though in this window? It's been a great window for Aston Villa so far. Could there be more arrivals at the club? Welcome to Nabeid Haroun, Kyle Walker and Michael Bridge. And to those of you watching on the Sky Sports News YouTube channel, we start with Everton and two days after sacking Rafael Benitez, the club continue to search for a new manager. Vinny O'Connor is at the club's training ground for us. Vinny, what is the latest on a replacement for Benitez? Well, obviously we know that Roberto Martinez is high on Everton's wanted list, but the Belgian FA want him to remain in charge with them and take them to the Qatar World Cup in November. Uh, Martinez was the Everton's board's number one choice back in the summer before they appointed Rafa Benitez. And we understand that Martinez himself would welcome a return to the club, which he has a huge affinity with as well. But it's unlikely that that would indeed happen before the World Cup finals. Of course, you look at his history with Everton. He took them to their highest points total in the Premier League, but he wasn't really able to build on that with two 11th place finishes that followed after that, leaving before the final game of the season in May 2016 after that defeat to Sunderland. The atmosphere about the club wasn't great at the time. I think in, in many ways, given the way he left the club as well, Roberto Martinez feels that he's got unfinished business here. However, the fact that he's committed to Belgium for the World Cup and they want him to stay makes a move to Everton at this point a difficult one and it seems pretty far away at the moment. Um, he obviously wouldn't want to leave the Belgian FA on, on bad terms either. So that brings other candidates into the frame, does it? Obviously, we've seen the link uh, with Wayne Rooney as well. Again, looking unlikely, but who knows for sure at the moment, because, again, there doesn't a, a, appear to be an agreed uh, way forward uh, at, uh, at the top of the football club at the moment. Rooney, of course, is contracted to Derby, but an approach from his point of view, I suppose, from Everton would be a difficult one to turn down. And you look at Derby's form at the moment, unbeaten in five league games, winning four. Uh, despite the points reduction, Rooney has got them off the bottom of the table as well. Uh, a faint chance that they could even escape relegation, I suppose, this season. Um, as for other possible candidates, we have to remember that in the summer, Nuno Espirito Santo was a target for Everton, so it makes sense that he would be considered again. Frank Lampard, Rudy Garcia, other names in the frame, Jose Mourinho, of course, being mentioned as well. In the meantime, we know that Duncan Ferguson will take training today with the players due back in after a, a day off. He took caretaker charge before the appointment of Carlo Ancelotti, of course, uh, winning against Chelsea, drawing at Old Trafford and drawing at home to Arsenal as well. Um, as time moves on this week, it will be looking increasingly likely that he will take charge of the side against Aston Villa. But if he were to take charge of Everton Football Club again, I think the feeling from Duncan Ferguson is that he would welcome the op opportunity to do it uh, at least until the end of the season rather than just one or two games. Finney, thank you. Oh, well, Everton fans, you were tweeting us all day yesterday about this situation. Hashtag transfer talk. We want to hear from more from you today as well. OK, Michael, you heard what Vinny said there. What do you think about the potential return of Roberto Martinez? Well, I think in an ideal world, what Everton need right now is a director of football. Then the director of football chooses the manager. But look, that's not going to happen. Why is Martinez being talked about again? Because obviously people at Everton like him. Did he do a good job at Belgium? Is he doing a good job at Belgium? Finishing third at the World Cup, quarter-final at the Euros, but the golden generation tag they've had with Belgium, could he have done a little bit more? I know he's done brilliant in qualification, doing well in the Nations League, but is it enough? Now, I remember the Everton fans weren't keen on Bene uh, Martinez near the end. There was Banner's style over results. Roberto out. Now, Everton fans never warmed to Rafael Benitez for the obvious reasons. Surely this is the time now. An appointment has to be where all the fans are united together. That's how I see it right now. And the majority of fans I've spoken to are against the move rather than for it. Mm, well, we're still asking to see what the viewers are, are saying on all of these candidates, uh, potentially. But, Nabeid, if not Martinez, then who? I mean, they're, they're stuck for options at the moment. I think uh, whatever solution they find has to be a feel-good factor. I think the, the feeling at Everton at the moment is the fans are very disjointed to the club. 
the manager, um, the players, and I think they've, they've got to find a solution for that. And I can only see one really, and it's Duncan Ferguson. My only concern is he's been with every manager uh, for the last six, and the manager's been sacked, but he hasn't. Um, but he's managed four games previously. He got some good results. And I just remember the mood around the stadium when he was there was very positive. He, he feels like he's one of their own. Um, I think the big detail here is they've got to have a rejig upstairs. Once they fix that, I think then they can look into a long-term appointment. For now, they've got to get someone in who understands the club, understands the players they're working with, um, and hopefully for Everton, finds a bit of a solution and a, a better mood. I think the mood is the key thing. Everton one of those clubs really good to Goodson Park. You don't want to go there if the fans are, are right on top of you. At the moment, it, it seems like an easy away day. I remember when you were saying about the mood when Ferguson was there. I remember him celebrating with the ball boy, uh, that famous <laughs> yeah. game that they won when he was in caretaker charge. Kyle, in terms of transfers, though, there's less than two weeks to go in this window. Whoever comes in with, like Michael said, no director of football, do they have to accept that, OK, this is going to be the squad now until the end of the season? If you look at what they've done over the last 18 days, the business, bringing in Nathan Patterson, also bringing in uh, Vitaly Mikolenko as well, if Everton fans were to look at those two transfers, you could say, all right, they're great people to, to bring in, if you look at those of in individuals, but they're part of a much wider transfer strategy, you can call it, over the last few years. Let's be completely clear, they spent a lot of money more than £500 million. Pounds. Now, when uh, Farhad Mashiri came in, took over the club, he said, I want Champions League football. He spent the money that you think that would get them Champions League football, but they're so far off that target right now. And it doesn't look like in the near future they're going to be climbing up to the heights of that in the Premier League. So you can look at the transfer business that they're currently doing and say it's great, but they've let Luca Dean go. We know that everything that happened with him, they've not got a manager. We know that they've had people above the manager leave as well recently. There's much more they need to do that's not just bringing in players that I think is so much more important. Yes, they've got two weeks to go. They could bring some players in, but is that going to be part of the long-term strategy for this club? What about if they bring players in in the next two weeks, they change the manager in another six months, and those players aren't part of that manager's plans? They need to get the foundations, they need to make them solid before they start bringing in and spending more money. I think the problem here is, like Carl just said there, is they had a strategy where they brought in James Rodriguez, Abdoulaye Decore, they brought in players that for two seasons or three seasons at most could get you possibly into Champions League football. They've now gone and bought two young fullbacks who are going to be around for the next five or six years. If the strategy now is let's plan for four or five years' time and they go and get a manager who they only want for a couple of years, like they did with Ancelotti, it just doesn't work. They've got to find something that works. And that hurt Everton, so, didn't it? That hurt them. They loved Carlo Ancelotti. Why wouldn't you? He's a glamour name. He's a big name. Going back to Real Madrid, though, it kind of came out of the blue and all of a sudden, oh, He's accepted that job. He brought in Alan as well from Napoli. It was fantastic when I saw him. So it's a bit of a shock to the system, I think, with Everton at the moment. But as you've just rightly said as well, whoever comes in, OK, they're, 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 the fans are glad that Rafa Benitez has gone. It never seemed it was ever going to work out. However, there's still a number of players they need to sell. And as Everton are finding, and other clubs too, selling players is sometimes harder than signing them. Can they afford, Michael, to take their time on this appointment? They've got 19 points from 19 games. They're six points above Norwich, who are 18th, but they do have two games in hand on them, one game in hand on Newcastle, who are 19th as well. So with that bit of breathing space, can they take their time and maybe have an interim appointment until the end of the season? Well, what's the old saying? The table doesn't lie. But this year, it does <laughs> because there's so many teams with games in hand, isn't it? So in a funny way, you look at you, your club in the league, you think, oh, I'm quite low. If I win my four or five games in hand, I can go here. I think what it does, and like you've both said, the feel-good factor of Duncan Ferguson comes back and I think that will play such a pivotal part but as I've said they still have a lot to do and the director of football is a key. But even if they bring in Duncan Ferguson and he takes over till the end of the season he gets some time to actually make that role his own uh, which he didn't last time he got four games as you said we're still seeing the mistakes that they've made over the last few years and they're still feeling the effects of those mistakes right now. Now, let's be completely honest, it's not the players' fault. They all want to win matches. It's not the fans' fault by any means. I don't even think it's Rafa Benitez's fault. I think, actually, 
the, the mistakes that have been made over those last few years, they're really now feeling the repercussions of those. And the next appointment might not be the caretaker one. If they give it to Duncan Ferguson, I don't think he can do... Uh, it's win-win it's for Everton, I think, in that situation. But when they bring in that next manager, I think that's key because where are Everton going to go in the next two to three years? Look at all the clubs that they want to be surrounding themselves with. They want to be West Ham in European football. They also want to be Tottenham, Arsenal. They want to be up there with these teams. And then you've got Leicester, who have fallen off this season, but have got the structure there to maybe climb back up and get back to that European side of things. That's where Everton want to be. And being honest, they're not there right now. And the Everton fans, they know that and they can see that. It, yeah, and it's so yo-yo as well, because as Benito said, he didn't have Calvert-Lewin for such a long mm. time. And a couple of signings they've made, Damari Gray, it, it started really well, hasn't he? Yeah. Andros Townsend left Crystal Palace, Everton. Great move for him. And he's worked 110% since getting that, joining that club. Everton fans weren't keen on him. He's, he's wanted to play through injury, Andros Townsend. Exactly. That's but Everton of, fans that's the rightly question like. Yeah, but Everton fans rightly question that about ambition. It gives you 110%. And he's been fantastic, Andros. I don't think this, um, this situation is too dissimilar to what United had when they gave Ole Gunnar Solskjaer the job. I think they were in a situation where they'd made a lot of ba bad transfer decisions, a lot of bad management appointments, and everything was everywhere. And I think Everton are in that situation now where they've got to get people on side, get everyone on side, and then think about where you're going next. Because at the moment, you do need a patch job. There, there isn't a manager who can come in with 13 days of the transfer window to go and say, I want five players, give me 150 million, I'll get us in the top eight. That's just not going to happen. They've got to find a manager who gets them to the end of the season and then put, play from there. So then, what do Everton actually do? Because over the last few years, since David Moyes left, they've had a different range of managers. Roberto Martinez, we've <laughs> talked about him. Then you, you go down, you've got Ronald Koeman as well, a manager that's been there, that's done it, that's gone on to, to do some great things as well. Sam Allardyce, Marco Silva, Duncan Ferguson for that period of time, Carlo Ancelotti, Rafa Benitez. That list of names is a great list of managers. So what do they do next? Because it seems like they've tried every single thing. They got very unlucky with Carlo Ancelotti. Yeah. I think that the plan was actually very good with yes. him. Getting a top manager, bringing top players and we'll get closer. And they were playing better football and they were getting closer. When he decided to leave, I think that two-year plan of getting closer, getting the money in from European football faltered and now they're sort of going, oh no, like we can't actually get what we're after. Mm. I actually like the look of Marco Silva at a time as well. You know, he, he did fantastic at Hull. People were like, who's this guy? And he did a really good job there. I've got to say, Barry... David, he has called me Rafa Benitez because of my phone. <laughs> I, know I know you're about to read it out, and I saw it. I was actually really looking forward to doing that before the break. Yeah, I can see it. The exact I can see it, from, Carl. from Barry, who's now my new favourite viewer, has Rafa's goatee transferred to Michael Bridges' chin. <laughs> <laughs> I will just say this, though, with Rafa Benitez and with Carlo Ancelotti, these previous managers, in Rafa's statement on his personal website, he says, it's only when you are inside that you realise the magnitude of the task. He said that himself. Maybe these previous managers, they've seen the magnitude of the task as well. So, yes, Carlo Ancelotti, the plan might have been right, it might have been great, but he left. But who is on the inside right now? Duncan Ferguson. Exactly, yeah. exactly, which was the original point that you've been making that until the end of the season. He's the one who does know it. So Rafa says you've got to be inside to see it. He does see it. By the way, on Martinez, uh, Marcus said we can't go for Martinez. Don't go back. And Pete says Martinez is not the right appointment at all. Why is he being mentioned? He can't get his team to defend. He mentioned a couple of other names where as well that haven't been mentioned. Kovac and Gaultier, if they could prize him away. But it looks like today... There's more, uh, more against Martinez than pro, whereas yesterday it was a little bit more split. Right, OK, Crystal Palace fans, we want to hear from you. We've asked you to get involved in Sign Call Cell. Head over to our Twitter page to get in touch. And we'll also have the latest on Dusan Vlahovic's future.
Arsenal fans have had reason to get excited lately because of those links to Dusan Vlahovic. Right, Kyle, give the Arsenal fans the latest. And Arsenal fans, we want to hear from you on this one and the rest of your business as well on hashtag transfer talk. Yes, the latest is Arsenal target Dusan Vlahovic. We've all been talking about him. He's been linked with many clubs, Arsenal being one of those. However, he would prefer to wait until the summer before making a decision on his future. But his club, his current club, Fiorentina, they're open to selling the striker this month. There's 13 days to do that and Arsenal fans would definitely want to get this deal over the line in those 13 days because of the interest that he will drum up over the summer. Now, the Italian club Fiorentina, they're ready to move quickly, according to Sky in Italy, because they want to ensure they get a good price for the youngster. He's only 21 years old. He's got 18 months left on his deal as well. Now, Arsenal retain a strong interest in Vlahovic, but will find it difficult to complete a deal this month due to the size of the transfer fee needed. This is a youngster that comes with a lot of, of talk, scores lots of goals, is going to cost a lot of money as well. Now, the manager, Mikel Arteta, is convinced they still have the pull to sign the world's best players, saying it remains one of our biggest powers. And as we were talking about yesterday on the shows, it does seem very positive with Fiorentina being open to evaluate what Arsenal would be able to offer. Well, Nabeid, how excited should the Arsenal fans be if they did get him? <sighs> He's an outstanding footballer. Um, I think every big club will want to get their hands on him if they can. Uh, 17 goals, two assists this season, 8.2 non-penalty XG. Uh, for context, Saka, uh, Ars who's Arsenal's highest in that, in that regard, has a 4.5 non-penalty XG. So he scores goals, he's good in the A, he's physical. My only ever so slight concern is um, the feeling that with everybody else involved, if Arsenal don't get him this window... Uh, they're not going to get him in the summer. Everybody will be after a, a striker. Once Haaland moves, once Mbappe moves, suddenly he'll be that player that everybody sort of wants. Um, and I think for Arsenal as well, they need that striker badly. With the, we don't know what's going on with Aubameyang, um, Lacazette as well, and then Nketiah. There's, there's a lot of question marks. Whereas this guy, you sign him and he'll be around for the next four or five years and whenever they come around selling him, they'll make money on him. Isn't that what they said about Aubameyang though? a few years ago and yes it's been very exciting but it has taken a bit of a sour turn you'd feel with the Arsenal fans anyway the ones that I've spoken to so it feels like this could be very exciting because it's the future they're finally moving away from all of the drama that seems to be around Arsenal Football Club and they can move forward actually and this a 21 year old is what Arsenal want to be signing if they can get that done in 13 days I just think that Arsenal fans will be so excited I think it makes them favourites for the top four I think he's a serious, serious striker. 21 years of age. Now, you can add Tottenham's North, uh, Arsenal's North London rivals Tottenham into the mix. If that goes into the summer, Antonio Conte said Spurs need a striker of the level of Harry Kane if they are to progress. That's great to hear because usually it's back up to Harry Kane. But that, doesn't, that shouldn't be happening anymore at Tottenham Hotspur. 21, it ticks all the boxes in terms of sell-on value. But I'm thinking in the summer, surely all major European clubs are going to be looking at this guy. I mean, I've been taking a look at him and his goals recently for Fiorentina because I know Arsenal and Spurs like him. I just find he's got pretty much everything and it looks like his physicality, he'd suit the Premier League. It was, it was previously someone described him as the next Haaland, which is a really strange comparison for me because <laughs> like, they're practically the same age and uh, this guy's dominating it in Serie A and I don't think there is a player quite like Haaland but I think the type of profile Vlahovic is, he can pretty much fit into any team in Europe, which is a big plus because I think there's a lot of players now who have a certain type of profile who either they're good in the air, like we've seen Chris Wood move to Newcastle, or they're quick and they can get him behind. He can do a bit of everything and he's brilliant in the box. And he himself described himself as uh, one day he wants to be like Zlatan Ibrahimovic. The brilliant news is, as you just mentioned about Aubameyang, is he's got an outstanding attitude. He's, he's a footballer's footballer. Every player in his team raves about his attitude. As lot, his previous managers and coaches have said he stays back after training. That's the character that Arsenal need in that dressing room if they want to compete for top four or for a title. I think profile-wise, he's, he's exactly the sort of guy Mikel Arteta would want. You might have a few offers in for you there. Do you see that header that he went to do when he, when he was talking about it? Arsenal might be yeah. in for you next. Look, look, look at the league table at the moment, though. Fourth is absolutely wide open. Forget about who 
you know, Spurs have got a couple of games in hand, sure. But Arsenal looking all right at the moment. They don't have Europe in the second half of the season, whereas West Ham do. They've got the FA Cup as well. Arsenal have been knocked out of that as well. Manchester United, OK, it's not started very well for Ralph Ragnick, but you kind of expect them to make a bit of an improvement. So if they did make that marquee signing, Surely that makes them one of the favourites. They've just got to get whatever cash they've got in the bank, put it on the table and send it to Fiorentina and get this man in in January. If they wait till the summer, it is going to be a scrap to get him. And at the moment, it feels like they've got a clear run. And Fiorentina want to let go of him. It, it makes sense. I don't know if you saw the they, video they yesterday. They get more money now than they would in the summer because of his contract situation. That's, and that's exactly why they want to want to sort of sell him on. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the video yesterday. He seems to be waving goodbye. Now, somebody said it was because of a missed penalty, but they were winning the game 4-0 at that point. Uh, so if he's waving goodbye, I think Arsenal fans will be very, very excited yeah. if they can get their hands it on It looks like they are trying to get it done now because of, like you said, and, and you as well, Michael, the amount of competition there would be in the summer. But, Kyle, what about outgoings at Arsenal? Yeah, Marseille, they're interested in signing Saeed Kolasinac this month amid interest from other clubs, including Napoli. Again, this is a story we have been talking about. He has been uh, interested, there's interest from other parties and other clubs as well. Now, Marseille have been in talks with Kolasinac's representatives about a pre-contract agreement because his current Arsenal contract is up in the summer. Also, another Arsenal defender, Pablo Mari, close to finalising a loan move to Udinese. Now, this deal is a straight loan and he's expected in Italy this week. Now, Mari has not featured in the Premier League for Arsenal since the home defeat to Chelsea on August 22nd. So it looks like he'll be making a move across to Italy this week. Right, keep it getting involved in keep getting involved at home it's time for sign call sell okay it returns this month so many of you got involved previously we asked you on the sky sports news twitter feed if you could sign anyone for your club who would it be who would you give a call to to see if they're interested maybe thinking outside the box and who would you sell we go through this alphabetically and today it brings us to crystal palace right i've got a few who've come in here uh, riley says to sign lewis o'brien from huddersfield he says call dean henderson and sell Yaro Riedewald. Uh, H says sign Christian Eriksen. We're going to be talking about him in detail a little bit later on this hour, actually, maybe at lunchtime as well. Call Sam Johnson. So, interestingly, another goalkeeper uh, there for, for a Crystal Palace fan. And sell Luka Milivojevic. And another one here. It's time for one more. South Carolina Palace says sign Jed Spence, who's on loan from Borough at Nottingham Forest. We were talking about him yesterday. Loads of... Premier League clubs interested in him. Maybe Palace is one of them. And he also says, sell Luka Milivojevic. Right, Michael, you know Crystal Palace very well. Are they trying to strengthen this month? Um, well, Vieira would probably like one or two. But let's remember, they had a brilliant summer window. They, they had a plan. There was worry. A lot of people had Palace to go down last summer. Let's not forget that. A lot of people had Patrick Vieira, the first manager, to leave. They're doing pretty well in mid-table. They've got a really, really exciting young side now. Loads, loads went out. They wanted to get the average age down. They've done that. They've brought in some exciting players. A fantastic loan in Conor Gallagher from Chelsea. So there's no desperation there. Would Patrick Vieira like maybe one or two more? Yes. Uh, we know there's interest in Eddie Nketiah. That hasn't really progressed since last week. Um, but I wouldn't be completely surprised if Palace didn't do any business this month. And it's a sign, you know. Things are going well there. It doesn't always have to be last minute, scattergun approach. They're happy at the moment. But I'm quite surprised that a couple of goalkeepers are mentioned there. They've got Vincenzo Guaita, of course, Jack Butland. He played really well the other day. He did. He made a mistake at Mill, but he, sh- he, was, he, was, he, was fine. he was good after that. So I'm a little bit surprised. And they want their captain gone as <laughs> well. So yeah. they, I think it's a sign of where Palace are. You know, they, they, they do have a good team. Are they maybe one or two short? Potentially, yes, with injuries. So when you say it might be quite quiet, does that include outgoings as well? Well, they've got Jean-Philippe Mateta up front. Um, now, their loan, they've got, that was a long-term loan deal. Now, Patrick Vieira is very happy with him. Uh, we know there was interest potentially from Burnley and Christian Benteke. We, we reported yesterday that he wants to stay. Again, Patrick Vieira seems happy with him. They've got Odson Edward up front as well. So they've got options up front. So I don't mean... To be too boring but I think they're pretty happy at the moment at Selhurst Park okay right well coming up on good morning transfers could we see Christian Eriksen return to the Premier League we'll be discussing that next
time now for State of Play and a player we would love to see back playing football and back in the Premier League too. It's Christian Eriksen. He's a free agent after leaving Inter Milan. We understand that Brentford are one of a number of clubs interested in signing him. So at this stage, it's interest. But could we see him back in England soon? Well, a lot of people have their concerns for Eriksen. It was only six months ago that he suffered a cardiac arrest on the pitch at Euro 2020. Some fans are understandably concerned about his health. Well, Nabade has spoken to Premier League doctors over the last few days, and maybe this can answer a few questions that fans have. Well, firstly, it would be incredible to see Christian Eriksen back. Uh, I think the key detail here is that it's quite unknown uh, as to what the cause of his cardiac arrest was, which is why there's so many questions from clubs, from fans. Uh, everybody wants to know what the ins and outs of, of, the, of the situation are, but every cardiac arrest can be different in terms of severity and in terms of how it happens as well. Uh, what we do know, he's previously had tests done, like most players do, uh, and if, if there's ever been a problem, it would have been highlighted, and up until this point, there was nothing previously highlighted. So in that sense, he was completely clear. Now, in Italy, there's a zero-tolerance policy on heart problems, which is why he won't be playing for Inter Milan, he won't be playing in Serie A. They won't want to take a risk on any player who's had any sort of heart issue previously. Um, and that's why now he's got this chance of coming back to the Premier League. But in the UK, up and down the country, players do actually have various types of heart problems, but we're not as severe here. Um, and in the Premier League, fortunately now, every single club has a, a person on standby who is who has a defibrillator and is trained with a defibrillator and that started after the Fabrice Mwamba incident. So I guess there is, that's probably why there's so much interest in the Premier League. That's probably why he's been linked to the Premier League so heavily as well. Uh, he's had an ICD put in, which is basically a device, an emergency device that can kickstart his heart should there be uh, an emergency problem and there isn't someone on hand that can help him out. Now, he's not the only player who actually has that. Daily Blind, who plays at Ajax, um, he also has that and plays and has been completely fine up until now and hopefully it continues that way. Uh, so it's not a completely uncommon thing for a player to have that. I know like when it first came out, a lot of people were a little bit concerned. Um, but as I mentioned, Blind is there. He's going to continue, this is Ericsson, will continue to have further cardiac screenings before he signs for any club, uh, which should essentially flag up if there is continuous issues. Uh, but as, as we've been told and as we're aware, he's ready to play. He's had tests done and he believes he can play. Um, but also this, this situation has happened before. Uh, Lloyd Remy was heavily linked to Liverpool uh, and the deal fell through because of medical issues, which we know now is, um, was due to heart abnormalities. But again, the, the, it's a different case for every club. He actually went on to sign for Chelsea and was completely fine and continued his career after that as well. So it was a case of Liverpool saying, we won't take a risk on this player. Other clubs can. And Chelsea did take a risk. And as I said, he, he was good to go. So as for excellent and any other player with heart conditions, um, there will be usual precautions in place. So we, in this case, if, if, uh, if it's too hot, uh, or if they go on an international tour and the temperature is too high or the player is dehydrated. Basically, anything that can cause a cardiac arrest, they will try and limit that as best as possible. And I think in that sense, you can understand where some clubs are sort of saying this will be a big risk for us to take on Christian Eriksen if he does come back and something does happen. And again, for other clubs who are saying we want Christian Eriksen through the door and we're absolutely fine with the, with the current, current state of play. Mm. So ju just to confirm there, that information that Nubaid has just relayed there has come from Premier League doctors, OK? And a lot of people have been asking us about that. We're not qualified, but those Premier League doctors are. So that was really interesting, actually, Nubaid. And, Michael, I think we're just so keen to see him back playing again, aren't we? And it, it would be great to see him back in the Premier League as well because he, he lit the place up. Yeah, that was so, so interesting listening to that. He's someone I regard highly as a player and I regard him very highly as a person as well. He's, he's a really top guy. Look, we don't know what impact he would make back in the Premier League. Uh, will he have reservations in terms of his playing ability and going forward and how, how he exerts himself as well? I'm just happy we're talking about this. I'll be perfectly honest with you because I and millions of others were fearing the worst when we were watching it on television. It wasn't good. So it's wonderful that this is even in discussion. I want to look at the positives. If Christian Eriksen comes back and is like when he was his time in the Premier League. He had made such a huge impression and Tottenham 
to this day miss him so much. He's never been replaced at Tottenham Hotspur. You only have to look at this graphic right now. First, in chances created, assists, goals outside the box, goals from free kicks. These are Premier League rankings. What a player he was. And I'm, there's many Tottenham fans who probably didn't realise the effect he would have because Spurs, as I say, have never replaced him. That type of creative midfielder. And, of course, he did well at Inter Milan. He had a slow start at Inter Milan, but I think it was a last-minute goal against AC Milan and he scored. And then he goes into Antonio Conte's thinking. So it's great to hear that there is interest in him again. And, um, you know, I wish him nothing but the best. Who needs him the most, or that type of player that we know he can be the most? Well, I've been looking at a few of the Premier League clubs, and there are a few that are linked with him that he could possibly end up at. He has said that, or it's been said that he wants to be back in London, so that could be a factor to it. Now, a few clubs will be looking at their midfields and just looking at the player, the, the chances created, the assist, all of the stats we've just seen there and know that Ericsson could help strengthen them. Now, Brentford are a club that are obviously linked to him and they want to secure another season in the Premier League. A player like Christian Ericsson could help them do that. Now, the boss, Thomas Frank, he's been open about his side struggles to create chances this season. And of course, as we saw, Christian Eriksen would solve that problem. You can see him here. We know over the years what he's managed to do in the Premier League. There is a striker at Brentford. His name is Ivan Tony. He broke the championship goal-scoring record last year. He's not found that form this season. He's only scored two from open play in 19 Premier League appearances. Look at those stats. 571 chances created, 62 assists. If you can put Christian Eriksen with Ivan Tony together, that could be a match made in heaven for Brentford fans and we could see him scoring plenty more goals. And the key, key detail here with Eriksen is, aside from hopefully his health is perfectly fine, he'll want to go somewhere where he feels at home. Yes. And I think Spurs in one end, he's obviously worked with Conte before, so that feels like a good fit, although it didn't work out initially. When Conte got him playing, he looked very, very good. But at Brentford, he's worked with Thomas Frank before, and there's a few players uh, in the Brentford side that he's also played with as well. So you get the feeling that those are actually his two best options, because if he goes somewhere where I think he doesn't feel at home with everything that's happened, I'd, I, I'm not sure how he would cope with that. So in this sense, I think he'll be thinking... I've got to go to one of these clubs and Brentford need him badly. Yeah. They need goals. Goals will keep you in the Premier League. And he knows London so well. That will be good to him as well. Good to his family. He's back in London. It, it ticks a lot of boxes, Brentford. I must say as well, when Antonio Conte said the door is always open for him, I think he meant in terms of training at Tottenham. I don't think he meant in terms of him signing as a player. Does that change going forward? We don't know yet, but I think that was a training kind of conversation. All right, well, now to this morning's guest, the Front Three podcasters. Kyle caught up with them yesterday to discuss the latest transfer news and what went wrong for Benitez at Everton. AJ, I'm coming to you. The big story over the weekend, Everton, Rafa Benitez, obviously he has now been sacked. I mean, what? who is at fault? Do you think it is the signings? Do you think that it's the, the stuff on the pitch or do you think there's more to it? I think it's a combination of many factors. Um, you look at Rafa going in there at the start. It was a tough job to go into. Of course, we know his legendary status, if we want to put it like that, at Liverpool. And then him going into an Everton side who who haven't had the greatest form of recruitment. You know, they've signed players who they can't move on, players who have signed long deals. And for me, a sticking point is always when you sign a player and you can't move them on for whatever reason, it means that there's a disparity somewhere. Something isn't working. And so I think most of the problems are off the pitch. You know, the recruitment side, you know, of things, they, they they completely dissolved it. And then you're looking at the signings that Everton have made and they haven't been great. You're looking at Everton team, you have players who've been signed by different managers. I think since 2016 to now, they've had six managers, including Rafa. We've never attributed that kind of instability with Everton, but suddenly we are, which is that there's a problem inside the club. Let's talk about a name that everyone has been mentioning over the last few days. It's Dusan Vlahovic. He's been heavily linked with Arsenal. Will, let's talk about him possibly going to Arsenal. Do you think that would be a great signing for them? Honestly, it'll be a massive signing. Uh, me and AJ are big Arsenal fans. We've been watching Arsenal since we've been kids. This will be one of the biggest signings, I think. If you look at the strikers in Europe, he is probably the most promising striker out there Na not named um, Erlen Haaland. So he'll be a terrific signing for Arsenal. He really fits into the mould of what Arsenal are trying to do now with having young 
great players, especially up front. Part of a transfer chat in January without mentioning Newcastle. So, Dan, let's talk about them. Who else do they need to bring in to make sure that they're a Premier League team next season? One thing I believe they need to sort of like settle on, because the names that they've been linked with are very good footballers. Very good footballers that will improve a Newcastle team. I'm just a bit mindful of the fact that they're coming into a team that's fighting relegation battle, and that might be something that they're not ready for, especially coming from abroad into the, um, the EPL. So that's something they need to settle on. Are we willing to bring in these players that, yes, they will improve the squad, but they might not be able to fight this battle that we're in, which means we risk getting relegated anyway. Let's talk Burnley. I'm going to ask all of you, starting with you, AJ. We're on the search for a striker. Who do you think would be a good fit for them? Mitrovic is absolutely smashing in goals for Fulham at the moment. He's on fire. He kind of fits the profile of how Burnley want to play. He's big, he's strong, he's good in the six-yard box. You know, if you feed him, if he's playing by himself, he can hold it up, he can bring others into play. So for me, I'd break the bank and go and get Alexander Mitrovic. He's played in the Prem before, he knows the league. And so for me, I'd, I'd desperately try and get him in. And yeah, I think for me, Mitrovic will be top of my list. Will, do you agree? I actually disagree with AJ on this one. <laughs> of course, of course. I'll actually go for Divock Origi from Liverpool. We know already that he's only got about six months left on his contract. So I'm thinking in terms of Burnley, I think this will be a great loan move for them. He's someone for Liverpool who has come up with crucial goals, especially against Barcelona in the Champions League and then against Tottenham in their Champions League final as well. He always seems to pop up at the right moments. The front three podcasters. For that, now it's time to test your knowledge of the January transfer window with this morning's teaser. Yesterday's question, it was too easy. Today's is a bit more challenging. We're asking which Newcastle manager sold Andy Carroll to Liverpool on deadline day in January 2011. We've got four options Chris Hewton, Steve McLaren, Alan Pardew, or Joe Kinney. Get involved. Tweet us at Sky Sports News using the hashtag transfer talk. And the answer is straight after this break.
Welcome back to Good Morning Transfers. Before the break, we asked you which Newcastle manager sold Andy Carroll to Liverpool on deadline day in January 2011. Was it Hewton, McLaren, Pardew or Kinnear? Did you get it? Everyone around this table actually did. The correct answer was... Alan Pardew. We made the move to Anfield along with Luis Suarez on a dramatic deadline day that saw Fernando Torres join Chelsea. So well done to everyone at home that got it. Well done to everyone around the table. And uh, Michael Bridge has been told in the past he looks like Alan Pardew. And so far today, we've been told your goatee looks like an old Rafa Benitez. We've been told it looks like Sean Dyche's goatee as well. And the best one we've just been sent a picture of is David Brent. Well... <laughs> <laughs> Right, it's been a turbulent season for Manchester United so far, but will they add to their squad in January? Anton Tolui, who's part of the transfer team, of course, caught up with United fan and MMA star Michael Venom Page, who didn't pull any punches when talking about the team he supports. This season hasn't exactly gone according to plan. We're in the transfer window, as you know. So, look, we've been told Manchester United aren't planning to be overly active this January. Is that a mistake in your mind? Um, yes, uh, I feel like there is a lot of dead wood that needs to go. Um, and it's, it's, it's weird as there's, there's so many players that I'm, I'm still fans of. I just don't believe they fit the system or, well, if we even create a system, <laughs> if we even have a system yet, um, I just don't believe they fit Man United and I, I did, they don't seem motivated. They don't seem um passionate enough to be there. Uh so I feel like that's why I'd call them Deadwood. Not that I'm not fans of them. They would have to go. And yeah, fresh, fresh, more excited people that want to come and win games. You know, there was an interview with um C Renato on Sky and how he was, you know, he can see he he just wants to win. He's annoyed by not being number one. But more people need to have that attitude. Um, Bruno Fernandez, same. Just annoyed. Anytime they lose a game, you can see how frustrated they are. Other players are just like, no, nah, we've lost the game. Walk off. And and I can't stand that. Um, it just, yeah, we we got we got to make some changes. Obviously, Manchester United now are trying to get into the top four. You've got Arsenal being linked with the likes of Dusan Blatovic. You've got Antonio Conte. We know how good a coach he is, and he's targeting players to improve Tottenham. How worried mm-hmm. are you? about the other sides and the business they can do this January and they might be able to sort of, you know, usurp United in the table. This is why it's such a crucial time. And if you don't make decisions now, because right now it is a weird one. I don't understand what it is, the chemistry in the gym. Obviously, we're not we're not there uh, in terms of behind the scenes to know what's going on, but something's off. Something's definitely off because the way they're performing is... I, I actually, I was at the game for... Uh, Man United against Wolves, and I, I was furious, man. They were, they just from start near enough start to finish. Second half they started to lift a little bit, but still wasn't good enough. It was just too late, too little, too late, and that's what it always feels like. We should be the team that's just on the front foot all the time. Um, so if you if you take a break in this transfer window and you allow other other teams to improve themselves, all you're doing is pushing yourself down to fighting for fifth and sixth place. Now, by the time you get into the octagon for your big world title fight, United will have two games left of their Premier League season. How confident are you they'll be in the top four come then and come the end of the season? (laughs) (laughs) Is it okay if I do that? Um, uh, You you, you respond however you want. At least you didn't swear. (laughs) That's the main thing, so... Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, seriously, not not that confident because I, I I'm not seeing I, I can't see what's what's happening. I can't I can't obviously we brought a new manager in. I can't tell just just yet what's what's going on. I was actually not disappointed. I kind of felt like you know Oli needed to go, but I don't necessarily feel it was his fault. And I I know for a fact it was hard to even see his his interview leaving and seeing how upset he you know he was. I know he wanted to do well, and you do want people like that. But again. There was no real system in place. I tell you, you should be doing the team talks. That would definitely give him a kick <laughs> up the rear. That's what they need. They need they need a bit of MVP in their life. That's what they need. Oh, 
I, I would I would definitely not be smiling in that change room. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Bonapage, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Good luck. Um, we'll all be cheering you on May 13th at Wembley. Bring home the title. Uh, you guys do the same. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, that's Manchester United. Now to Newcastle United. Newcastle fans, you've got about two minutes to get in touch here. Hashtag transfer talk. Now, according to Carve Solical on the transfer show last night, there are positive signs regarding Newcastle's interest in Sevilla centre-back Diego Carlos. Right, Nabeid, why is a centre-back their priority now? I've gone stack crazy here because I was screaming for a centre-back at the start of the window for Newcastle fans because... That is the one area of the pitch, along with a striker, that they need to fix. 43 goals conceded this season. Only Norwich have conceded more. Last season, they conceded 62. Fulham, who got relegated, conceded 53. 35.x A as in chances against. Uh, only three teams have worse than them. Uh, so at the start of this window, I was saying striker and a centre-back. They got themselves Chris Wood as part of the fix done. But at the back, they've got big, big, big problems. They concede far too many goals. And uh, no matter how many you score going forward, I think you stay in the league if you can defend. Mm. Uh, well, last week, it was about the attack. Yep. And they were really desperate to get a player in before that Watford game. Why might there not be so much of a rush now for Newcastle? Well, they've only got one more game and then they've got a bit of a break. They play this Saturday, they've got Leeds, and then they've got 17 days before their next game. Now, as you said, if we go back to last week, they set themselves a deadline to bring in a striker before that game against Watford at the weekend. That meant because the game week started on Friday night, they had to get a player signed by 12pm on the Thursday. So they don't have that rush anymore. There's 13 days left in the transfer window for them. They can take their time, play this game this weekend and then they've got a bit of time to identify where they need to bring someone in. Final game of the season, Burnley v Newcastle. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely massive. OK, Nabade, Kyle and Michael, thank you for now. We will be back later though and remember Good Morning Transfers is back in the morning at 9am we with Joe Wilson tomorrow as it is on Wednesdays and Fridays and this team are back in a couple of hours midday for Transfer Talk. And as for the Transfer Show, just note the uh, different times, 5pm as usual, but also 6.30 tonight with Darmesh and Carve. But the Football Show is next. We'll have more on Everton's search for a new manager as Duncan Ferguson takes training today.